Hello, and welcome to the AAMFT Podcast, your all-access pass to the latest news developments and thought leaders in the world of systemic therapy. We strive to relate, educate, and innovate one episode at a time. I'm your host, Dr. Eli Karam, and we're brought to you by the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. Our podcast explores topics that relationship-based therapists care about. In addition to featuring unique conversations and interviews with established experts, our show provides information and education on direct practice and emerging trends in the MFT profession. For more information, please visit us at aamft.org. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. There is a high degree of overlap in the goals and strategies of couple and relationship education and the practice of couple and family therapy. Given these similarities, there's a great potential benefit for the integration of relationship education into the formal training of MFTs. One of the greatest examples of relationship education is PrEP. The PrEP approach stands for Prevention and Relationship Enhancement Program. It's relationship education that teaches couples both premarital and marital, how to communicate effectively, to work as a team to solve problems, to managing conflicts, and to preserving, enhancing commitment and friendship. It's been delivered to many different populations, but it's usually in a group format, and it uses techniques that, as couple therapists, we're all familiar with. Today, we're going to do a deep dive into relationship education from the masters. I call them the godfathers. Once a teacher-student relationship. They've gone on for the last 30 plus years to have a great partnership. I'm talking about Dr. Howard Markman and Dr. Scott Stanley. Their insights and commitment to sound research have led to advances in so many areas of marriage and relationship health, including communication, conflict management, and commitment. Howard is a professor of psychology at the University of Denver, He's a widely sought after expert on marriage and romantic relationships. He's been on shows like Oprah, The Today Show, and featured in New York Times, Time Magazine, The Washington Post, among others. He's co authored 12 books, including We Can Work It Out, 12 Hours to a Great Marriage, and the classic Fighting for Your Marriage, which he collaborated on with Scott. Scott is a research professor in the Department of Psychology, also at the University of Denver. He authors the very popular blog, Sliding Versus Deciding, which is, he'll mention today, and if you've never read that, it's a great and informative read. It highlights research and insights about commitment and relationship development. He's also appeared in major media outlets like USA Today, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. He's been on the Today Show and on news programs like 2020 and Fox News. I had so much fun sitting with these guys. I have really followed their work for a long time and see a great, as a clinical trainer and MFT academic, I see a great overlap in relationship education and the practice of couple therapy and had so much fun. I think you will too, and I'll be back after the interview. So pleased to be joined on the AAMFT podcast. Uh, When I think of relationship enhancement, relationship education, and researchers and just overall good guys as far as personal and professional partnerships i think of scott stanley and howard howie markman and i'm so happy to have you guys here and we're going to learn a lot not only about the origins what got you interested in this work but really what has spanned four decades now of amazing work as the research and most of the people listening to our show are working with couples in some way or or form as far as relationship education as a correlate to therapy and the fact that many of the great skills that you'd use in good couples therapy come from manualized relationship enhancement and education curriculums like prep. So we're going to talk a lot about that. But guys, if you've listened to the show, the first question is always the same when I'm talking to pioneers and luminaries in the field is what got you interested in studying relationship? Tell us your kind of origin story, if you will. Uh, it's going to be interesting. I'm not sure Scott and I have ever had this talk. Scott, you want to start? You want me to start? Uh, uh, I'm happy to start if you want. Okay, why don't you start and then I'll uh, talk about I think we have different origin stories. Yeah, so my start, when I graduated from high school, 
I'm um, not going to go all the way back to grade school, but uh, when, I, when I graduated from high That's school... That's when we met Scott. We met when we were in grade school. <laughs> we, we've been working together, Eli, for <laughs> 43 years. You guys are like a professionally married to each other, it's as we say. It's just crazy. Yes, it's... Uh, it's and we uh, haven't had an argument yet. No, yeah, <laughs> no. So I'm, I'm graduating from high school, and aptitude and interest-wise, I am thinking at that time that I'm either going to be an engineer, like my father was, uh, probably an electrical engineer at that time, or uh, that I would be an accountant because I had some interest in being an FBI agent that went all the way back to my youth. So if I had chosen that path, I might be like a contemporary of all the excitement in D.C. right now. But uh, I didn't choose that, choose that path because around that time, I, I, I started college in a county major, but my it was becoming very clear through that time that my next oldest brother had schizophrenia. Uh, and, you know, there were lots of things you could tell looking back that were signs of things to come, but uh, it was, you know, I think it was clearly diagnosed by the time that I was early in college. And that had a profound impact on me because it sort of moved me from, first off, it got me interested in sort of questions about psychology and dynamics and about mental health, but it also moved me from those prior interests to wanting to do something that was more about helping people and service to people. And that got me interested in psychology. And I started to take a few classes, uh, including uh, with Howard. <laughs> so, so we go back that far. Uh, and I got really excited about psychology and about research and about studying relationships. So that's sort of the, the story for that part of it. It also, as our listeners know, I mean, there would be no MFT, marriage and family therapy, without the studying and communication. And the number one illness that MFT and all this ragtag collection of professionals was interested in studying was uh, schizophrenia and double bind communication. So it's amazing that your own family of origin kind of parallels that. It's Howie, tell us how, uh, how you got interested in relationships. I will in a second, but Scott mentioned that he was thinking about being uh, an FBI agent. And it turns out that he's actually a CIA agent, meaning that he's all about commitment, integrity, and being an all-around good person. so I was wondering how you were going to make that out. <laughs> I, th- I thought you would go with attachment, though, actually, at the end, but uh, that, that, that works. We're going to back down there. So my story is a little bit different. I was planning uh, not to be an engineer or FBI agent. I was planning to be a lawyer and went to uh, Rutgers University uh, with the full intent to uh, do pre-law, started majoring in uh, poli-sci and history and really enjoying that. And most of my really good friends uh, went on to law school and very successful lawyers and politicians and activists and so on and so forth. But it hit me sometime during late sophomore year that maybe that's not where I want to go. So this is a true story. I went to the library, decided I was just going to walk around, pick an owl, pick a book. And I did that. And just so happens the book I was Freud's uh, introductory lectures at uh, Clark University in Massachusetts, I think 1909 or something like that. And I actually sat on the floor, I remember sitting on the floor and just read that whole book for a couple hours. Or, and I said, this is really, really fascinating. I'm going to start taking psych courses. I'd never taken a psych course. So uh, I started taking psych courses and uh, just uh, like Scott was saying, just uh, really intrigued me. I loved background psychology, a lot of social psychology in the uh, the field at that point as it related to relationship, but all that research, and I'll get back to this in a minute, it was really about strangers or some college student situations. Now, ironically, Rutgers turned out to be a very, very, very behavioral place. So I don't think the name Freud was ever mentioned in my undergraduate career, except maybe uh, just by passing. But the thing that really got me interested in working in relationships, that's a psych aspect, is that I was a preceptor in our a, in my senior year at Rutgers, and it was all male at that point in time, and my uh, students would, uh, at the in the dorm, would come and ask all these relationship questions. What should I do about this? What should I do about that? And so on and so forth. And so I said, okay, I'm a good psych major. I'm going to go back into uh, the literature and uh, kind of try to find uh, research-based answers to the questions. And there were none. There were none. There was just not any really good research back then 
on what makes a good relationship. There was no studies really of real couples at that point in time. Most of the data were interview data and then a lot of the social psych attachment or attraction kind of situations. So I said, okay, I'm going to go to grad school and I'm going to study relationships and uh, both basic research and how to help people. And that got me going. Oh, I just have to chime in here. So uh, on part of that story, because I, I don't think I'd heard that story about the Freud's introductory lectures before in terms of the book, but there I figured out that I was going into psychology. So I gone to Bowling Green and went away for a year and then I came back to Bowling Green. Howard was a brand new assistant professor there at Bowling Green and either the first or the second class I had. You guys look so youthful I don't want to date you but what year are we for our listeners like to put us in time? We're in 77 now. Okay. And the first or second class that I took from him was personality and he uh, so he has like a 10 week class this is a quarter system and he spent uh, it was It was really actually fantastic. He spent three of the weeks giving Freud's lectures as if he was Freud. And it was uh, both hysterical and it was fascinating. And so that book had made such an impression upon him that, uh, that he came in and impersonated Freud for three weeks for the class. It was pretty great teaching. <laughs> you remember Howard is like one of your most charismatic instructors at that time? Oh, is that, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so much passion and interest and energy. Couldn't stand still in front of the room either, which you know, he's always, <laughs> always moving around. Uh, walking into stuff and everything, but but that he's, hasn't changed, has it, Scott? <laughs> no, but he's he, and I can still remember the room. It, it, but uh, he just did a great job, and he and he would, he stayed in character. It wasn't like he would sort of pop out of. Uh, being Freud. He was Freud for like three weeks. And I understood myself so much better after that. How do we get from that to being collaborators? Well, uh, the other class that I took from Howard was on marriage and family. So not a shock. He taught the marriage and family course in the psych department. And as you mentioned, Eli, you know, before AMFT was kind of a thing, but you know, Howard was interested in the couple stuff for a long time. And so he would cover, you know, the classics and uh, all kinds of things. But that got me interested in that. And that had more meaning for me in terms of a uh, place to work that had meaning. And from there, I started working in his lab as a junior in my second junior year, because I lost a year of uh, when I switched my major. And I would say by some time that summer, I was pretty much running his lab. Well, I never knew that about you guys. So then, okay, we're interested in studying communication. Though at this time here in the late 70s, I mean, couple therapy is just starting. Everybody learning to do couple therapy is a behavioral marital therapist at the time. This idea of relationship enhancement, relationship education, marital enrichment. I'm going to ask you the evolution of how you guys branded what you were doing, but none of that was out there. So for our listeners, and many, many of us are familiar with the prep curriculum or just psychoeducational curriculums with skills built in. But at the time, you guys were, you know, groundbreakers and pioneers. What gave you the idea to t- take research into actually education and practical skills for couples? How did PrEP launch? Yeah, so right at that point in uh, 77 with Scott and then uh, my first grad student was Frank Floyd, we had done in grad school, I had done in grad school just basic research on you know what predicts uh, success in a relationship with some longitudinal studies. Then my goal when I started my job at Bowling Green was really to start putting that into action with the, uh, the early uh, version of the, uh, the prep program. So we really started in 97 working together as a team, uh, you know, taking a lot from, uh, you know, behavioral marital therapy at the time, but also kind of thinking, you know, carefully, what do we want couples? And we really started at the planning marriage period, okay, the transition to marriage. And PrEP was actually, now it stands for the Prevention and Relationship Education Program. Back then, we were calling it the Premarital Relationship Enhancement Program. So we really started focusing on premarital couples. And divorce was uh, going up very, very rapidly during that time period. It actually peaked in uh, about 1981, 1982. And 
I and Scott and Frank and others in the field were really concerned about uh, what this meant, the rising the divorce rate, and obviously that was related to issues in relationships. And the question was, you know, what can we do based on research at the time to help couples learn skills and principles uh, associated with a happy relationship and get these tools and principles into their hands be, uh, before they start their marriage? And, you know, that really continues today, though we know a, a ton more about uh, what makes for a successful relationship and how to uh, help couples learn these skills and principles. So the idea was really trying to take the basic research and what we knew about couples therapy at the time and translate it into a research-based program that we could teach couples these skills and principles be, uh, before they were getting married. So I just want to add some of the it's such an interesting zeitgeist for all that because, um, as Howard mentioned, so Frank Floyd was his first grad student, and this happened before I was working with them, and I, you know I think it happened in Howard, you know, sometime before that. But just to really target this idea of helping people before marriage to prevent divorce, and Howard and Frank had written a, a really uh, important paper uh, with the title "The Possibilities for the Prevention of Divorce." I think that was nineteen. I don't know when was that might have been published in eighty, but I think obviously it was published in eighty. But yeah, was, so that manuscript would have been working before sometime before that. But so they were going after that, and as Howard said, I mean, this is right in the time in the U.S. when the divorce rate is just exploding. You know, it started to move up in the late sixties, was really ramping up in the seventies, and you know, as a number per thousand, really peaked. Uh, in 79 and then again in 81. So it's like right in this time. And that also uh, had a lot of appeal for me. And, you know, I was getting into the research part and was really enjoying working in Howard's lab and, and the kind of stuff that they were doing was fascinating in terms of recording couples' conversations and coding them and seeing what you could learn. But the other appeal to me, going back to the part of, of how my story moves into that, so, you know, I was looking for things with meaning, and I have a, more of a, a conservative religious background in my history, and uh, just the idea of really helping people with their marriage and trying to reduce the odds of divorce was very motivating, super appealing to me in terms of how we started working together and what they were, were starting to really focus on. For those that are not familiar, let's talk about the major differences between a relationship enhancement manualized program and the traditional practice of couple therapy. Um, because I think as, a, as an educator and a trainer that it's a great place to introduce manualized curriculums in training programs because students are just learning to get comfortable with couples and many of programs like prep have just great both psychoeducation and skills which you need both to be a good couples therapist so this stuff is right up the alley of our audience of, of the podcast but just generally how would you guys describe the major similarities and differences between a relationship enhancement and uh, couple therapy yeah. let me just kind of make a couple of general points that but we don't really think about it as relationship enhancement, though we you know, really do that in a lot. We're really thinking about it as education that people can use uh, if they're motivated to increase their chances of having a successful relationship. And even though we were kind of initially thinking about divorce, you know, one of the things looking back at that period that a lot of those divorces were really, really, you know, positive divorces. Women were working outside the home. They had the resources to uh, to seek a divorce and not being dependent on their partners in relationships that were often abusive. So that, you know, our thinking has changed over time, really. The goal is not to prevent divorce as much as it is to provide couples with the skills and principles and tools through, you know, research-based and somewhat manualized, though there's a lot of flexibility flexibility in all our prep family of programs these days, but to, uh, you know, to really give them an edge in terms of having uh, a relationship that fits the hopes and dreams that most of us have to have a, a successful lifetime love over time. And, and that's the goal overall. And, uh, you know, a lot of uh, couples therapy now, IBCT, CBCT, EFT, really incorporates a lot of uh, skill training, training and principles. So there's a lot of overlap these days in terms of research-based therapy and, uh, and uh, relationship education like we, uh, like we do in prep and we have a 
a family of PrEP-related programs that we can talk about as we go on, including an online program. But the, the, I train people in couples therapy here at the University of Denver, and basically we, we've kind of developed uh, what we call the PrEP approach to couples therapy, where people kind of follow the PrEP program and incorporate it and individualize it and tailor it to the couples. And like you're saying, Eli, it's a great way to really take what we do in uh, relationship education you know, which is a class and people don't talk about personal things into the the therapy uh, arena because it's a good way for young therapists to start learning uh, how to work with couples and people really like the structure that they can fall back on and know that they're incorporating a program that has a research base. I I would also say it's such an important question that you're asking, Eli. Uh, first off, totally agree with Howard. Uh, the mission, uh, the goal is really sort of, I'd say, broadened greatly. So people have lots of different goals now, and there's lots of uh, more information about things like Howard said, you know, like relationships where, you know, that's just not going to work uh, or it's going to be harmful for children. So there's a big, you know, broadening of that compared to the original thing. But also just a, a much greater awareness in, in our world dealing with relationship education of all the different places where people might benefit from knowing a little bit more about how to navigate relationships, how to make their relationship better, how to prevent some problems in the first place. And one of the growing areas is really a lot of emphasis on individualized relationship education, which is focused more on helping this person make the best decisions. But I want to come back to your question for a second about uh, therapy, because I really want to emphasize something that was embedded in it, and then we can follow any of those threads that you want. I think, I think all three of us think this is true. The best couples therapists, they don't all have to have the same model, but they have to have some model, and they have to have a toolkit. Every, every couples therapist has a set of tools that are the ones that they reach for most typically. And the work on PrEP, has it developed it in, in terms of uh, how Howard developed it, it really began focused strongly on things from sort of the cognitive behavioral, behavioral marital therapy was really, a, you know, a sort of a big foundation in all the observational research uh, for what PrEP was at the beginning. And it's grown over the years. I, we've added a lot on themes like commitment, which is, uh, of course, near and dear to my heart and something that I've studied a lot. And that a lot of that material now works into all the kinds of things we do. But back to therapists for a second. Good therapists are fundamentally educators. It's not like going, going back to like Freud's introductory lectures. I mean, you can have psychodynamic uh, couples therapy and, and people do that. But most people don't practice couple therapy from sort of that kind of deep insight approach, although a lot of people do approach it a lot in terms of helping to improve attachment. But every couple, every couple's therapist has sort of strategies that they use, and a lot of those strategies are going to be fundamentally educational. So a lot of the things that we tend to do and emphasize in prep have just as much applicability in working in the room with a couple in therapy as in education, but the way that you frame it, the way that you approach it and talk about it is, of course, different, and the motivation of why the people are there can be different, but the strategies are often real similar in terms of helping people get what they're going after in their relationship. Another thing that you guys are alluding to that sometimes, you know, therapy, depending what your orientation is, as far as a consumer, where your background is, has a negative connotation or you have to have a problem. I think another thing about relationship education, whether you're getting it on the front end as premarital work, maybe through your church or religious institution or you're, you're just getting it, it is more palatable in some ways. It has a more uh, health stigma to it than therapy, but the, the stuff is the same. I couldn't agree with you more. Those skills Skills, both skills and the psychoeducation, which we're going to talk about today, that are paramount to both good relationship education and good couples therapy. So let's think about of all of the years, the 40 plus years of prep, the psychoeducation, the research, and you guys are also not only this professional partnership, but you, like I think of Scott and commitment. When I think of Scott, I think of sliding versus deciding, which is a, a Scott original that the way you all have also marketed 
and uh, distilled down some of these uh, relationship issues to very easy to remember and catchy ways that gravitate towards both therapists, practitioners, and the individuals and couples that receive this relationship education. So tell us about the most clinically relevant findings applicable to our audience from the 40 years of PrEP. Howard, why don't you start with communication? Well, I was actually going to start with uh, commitment. I think everybody associates, <laughs> uh, no, seriously, I mean, I think the uh, the work on communication that, that I've done, Bob Weiss, uh, Birchler, Vincent, John Gottman, who I work with, Clifton Terrius, you know, and it still continues today, Rick Heyman doing a lot of the work, you know, clearly showing that uh, the quality of the couple's communication uh, is really important, particularly handling negative emotions and how people connect and disconnect. And uh, so clearly people associate PrEP uh, with, uh, you know, I like to say now that the importance of, of uh, having skills to talk without fighting about inevitable issues in relationship, but also talking about really meaningful, deeper issues and themes and being able to do that in a safe environment, emotionally safe, physically safe, safe in terms of the the commitment. So people think about PrEP and uh, a lot of what we do in terms of helping people communicate better, and we know we can do that. I can work with any couple, I believe, and help them communicate better, talk without fighting about any issue, uh, using the principle. That doesn't mean that's going to, you know, in therapy, save their marriage or give them a 100% uh, a chance for having a great relationship, but people can learn those skills and uh, apply that in their relationship. But I think one of the major advances, and I'll give the floor to Scott here, which Scott's work, well, and we call Scott around the prep office and uh, I think now across the world, Dr. Commitment, and, and the, the work that Scott did, you know, there's been other work in commitment, of course, that, uh, that Scott built on, but being able to really help people understand the importance of commitment, the different types of commitment, and weaving that into a psychoeducational approach was brilliant and really deepened what we do in PrEP and in the whole field of education and therapy. Of course, Scott's sliding the siding. He has a, a blog on that that I, that I recommend. And uh, whenever I want to steal some good ideas, I go to the blog and uh, take them as my own. I'm just kidding. The, uh, so I just kind of the work on the commitment side of it and everything that means and the work that now Galena Rhodes has been doing with us and one of our former students and now an uh, internationally known colleague. Uh, that, that's just been so important, I think, doesn't get the attention that it needs. You know, we certainly didn't think of this. That it was, we didn't think all of this was happening or, or coming about back in the late 70s. Maybe Howard did. But, but as we were working together, the, the fact that Howard was so deeply immersed in communication and the history of the research on that and strategies and techniques about that. It was actually in the early 80s that I got really interested in commitment as a topic and thinking about it empirically, particularly how do you measure it. And that led to this basic distinction that a lot of people recognize in the field and it shows up in different kinds of ways, including in a lot of writings in sociology and a lot of writings in psychology. But fundamentally revolving around basically sort of the want to versus the have to, you know, the, the dedication versus constraint. What was so good about that in terms of prep is that's such a great, you know, to have communication and commitment be like the cornerstones of the strategies that are infused throughout prep and the things we're trying to teach people really addresses two fundamentally important things. One is where are we at in terms of us with a future and what does that mean about our priorities and how do we treat each other today and this week and tomorrow. And so you add along with that what's uh, always been a passion for Howard to emphasize uh, the positive connection between two people, the fun, the friendship, and the connection. That's kind of a pretty complete set of things to work under in terms of categories to try to figure out what kinds of things different people might resonate to or what they could use. Now, the one other thing that turned out to be really beneficial about the, the commitment stuff, because it had a lot of obvious legs right from the beginning in terms of what are the elements that research tells us are associated with dedication. Well, you can turn those things into suggestions for people in terms of, you know, if you want your relationship to be stronger, you got to make it a higher priority. you got to look at how you're 
thinking about it in terms of us versus me versus you. You got to think about how you're dealing with a, a potentially attractive alternatives. That's all the, the kind of obvious but straightforward dedication stuff that we could bring into it. But then when uh, around 2000, and this was happening in the later 90s, but Galena comes to DU at, at 2000. So Howard and Glenn and I, I'm increasingly getting interested in research on cohabitation, premarital cohabitation. Galena got really interested in that. And that led to like one of the kind of, I think, watershed moments on the commitment side in the field, which was the prior theories, particularly Carol Rusbolt's theory, which was just immensely valuable to the field in terms of the investment model, was kind of focused on how commitment developed in the first place? How did it grow in terms of what it grew from, in terms of people increasing their investments and becoming more satisfied? And then, you know, here's some commitments developed. What came out of the cohabitation stuff that was just fascinating was a different developmental understanding about commitment related to the timing of dedication versus constraint. So where Howard and I started, we're back in this zeitgeist of, you know, well, everybody's going to get married, which, you know, of course, isn't true anymore. But, you know, that was the goal for so many people and stability and all. But what we moved to was a situation starting in the late 90s into the 2000s and since then, where so many important relationships form for people long before they're ready to settle down in marriage or really develop a family. And in a lot of what happens now, and this is one of the insights really coming out of the cohabitation work with Galena and Ian Howard, is that for a lot of people, what essentially they do is they increase the constraints on the relationship, the difficulties of leaving, before they've actually decided they want to stay, before they really clarified that we want a future and that it's mutual. And that led to like a bunch of insights that are not only useful in working with couples in terms of thinking about how the commitment developed for this these two people sitting in front of me and did constraint develop ahead of dedication. But it also became really a cornerstone, a foundational piece in our work with individual relationship education models now where we want to help people understand what to look out for in terms of the sliding versus deciding kind of dynamic. So I would just build on that. I think Scott keeps on mentioning the individual relationship uh, education and we're just finishing up myself, Scott. Uh, Galena, by the way, Galena is Galena Rhodes. <laughs> I think most people know of Galena's work now and probably should interview her separately. Uh, she's just doing some amazing work and taking the uh, within, our, uh, within My Reach program that uh, Scott Galena and others really have been working on and taking it to uh, low-income moms who are uh, having a baby. Her program is called Motherwise, but it's a, a, a paradigmatic shift from uh, working with couples, which we still do, and that's also very, very important, but being able to expand our reach, and that's one of the things that we can do with education versus therapy. I mean, you could be a couples therapist uh, for 40 years and, you know, see 40 couples a week for 40 years. You do the math, uh, how many people you can reach, but if you do education and you do one workshop once a week with 40 couples for 40 years, the reach is tremendous, especially when you're working with a diversity of couples, diversity of individual and across, across uh, uh, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, economic uh, diversity. And that's really one of the really important things about education. And when working with individuals, we can really help people you know, make better decisions, make good decisions. So, uh, and a lot easier in some ways to, uh, you know, you can bring this down to grade school, high school, and a lot of people are doing that. Yeah, I'll share a personal story about that with you guys. I've been at the, uh, this is my 13th year at the University of Louisville, which uh, listeners know is uh, teaching this program that is a co-empty accredited program. It's only one housed within a school of social work where students get two degrees, social work and marriage and family therapy. So all of our connections and practicums and placements are in the community of Louisville. And uh, my colleague, Dr. Becky Antle, had, had just gotten one of these healthy relationships grants, and we were working uh, in the early stages of Within My Reach, and we were working with the population you described, population of single people that uh, come from economically disadvantaged backgrounds that 
many did not have a healthy blueprint for what a good relationship is. These are people that would have never have gone to traditional uh, relationship therapy with a couple, with their partner, much less their own, or had the means to get to it. But this was a, a class that only not only built community, another advantage of a program like this, you're not taking it by yourself, you're building community. So you get out of the bubble of your head and you realize other people, it normalizes it to psychoeducation, have these issues. And then you have, if you don't know, you didn't get this stuff in school, which nobody did of how to have a healthy relationship. Now you have a model for that. So just like MFTs, you know, in the general public, MFT is often confused with, oh, you guys only see couples and families. No, it's a systemic way of thinking about people in their context and their relationships. In fact, marriage and family therapists, as listeners know, uh, nationally, you know, half of their caseload are individuals looking at individuals from a relational perspective. And much like relationship education prep, as you've outlined so far in our talk today, started out with premarital couples. And now it's so much more. So this outgrowth, I can tell you guys are and should be proud of it. Like, what have we learned uh, from the within my reach data? One thing we've learned is that people are very interested in it. So I'm going to talk about some uh, couple specific findings that uh, obviously uh, Becky, Antle, and, and others have worked on, and you worked with her on that project. But the most exciting outcome is actually just how much interest there is, how much, if you think about this, and, and you just made the comment, Eli, that reflects this, you know, most people that work as marriage and family therapists, it's it's a mindset, it's a systems view that doesn't necessarily mean you're always working with couples. And in fact, even on the individual therapist side, Howard and I did a survey a bunch of psychologists many years ago with another psychologist in town uh, named Chuck Lobitz. And we found in that survey, I forget the exact number, Howard might remember it. Do you remember the number, the percent? It's a lot. I mean, it's like a huge. Maybe fifty percent of the clients that individual therapists see are couples. So, you know, the, the relationships are everywhere. We all know that, and that's what brings people to therapy. But the the individual approaches in terms of the relationship education field, it has so much upside because there's so many places where knowledge about relationships, knowledge about good decision-making in relationships, how you communicate well with other people in relationships, is so much vaster of a field than like just this couple right here. And a, a lot of people that are really interested in this kind of approach, uh, like in Within My Reach, or other individual approaches to, to helping couples, uh, a lot of people that are interested in that as participants they're not sure about the particular relationship they might already be in. Is it is it a good one? Is it going to last? Are they committed? But they're really interested in understanding more and finding a good path to the future for them. And uh, along with just kind of along the theme of advances in relationship education over uh, these decades and where we are now and where we're going, that and this is especially relevant in the, the COVID environment, that uh, we're finding in our own uh, couples therapy clinic that there are so many advantages to doing the telehealth, both in terms of service delivery. People are in their own homes. They don't, for a 50 minute session, probably in Louisville, Denver, anywhere else, that there's really a three to four hour commitment in terms of getting there, getting babysitters arranged. And now people can sit down, do the session, and they're doing the, the work, learning the skills and applying them where they are. So I think that's really important and I think we can do that individually we can do that uh, with couples online interventions uh, we have an online program that's both synchronous and asynchronous and uh, so couples can uh, learn these skills and principles now in any number of different ways and that really also extends our reach so one of the things I'm proudest about uh, working with Scott Galena and a host of others uh, Jesse Owen who was at Louisville as you know that uh, we can uh, help people at any stage of the lifespan at this point in time through any number of different uh, interventions. So maintaining our core work with couples, relationship education, and uh, one of the new things we're doing is talking about how to help these individual therapists who are seeing a lot of couples or seeing a lot of people with relationship issues. I do think that's the major, uh, one of the things we find in others, that the major thing that individual therapists are dealing with with people are relationship issues. So we're really now doing uh, with Galena and Scott and I trying to train individual therapists 
with the PrEP approach in the PrEP approach to uh, couples therapy. This is such an exciting time. This is for all the students out there and young professionals really not only learn skills in, in therapy, but uh, really focus on uh, various forms of relationship education. I mean, there are a lot of programs out there besides PrEP that are research-based. Even if you haven't been trained systemically or you're not an MFT, but you're working with individuals and they're talking about a lot about their relationships, it's almost like these are the skills that you need. And your model, maybe outside of the scope of an interview like this or our listeners, but your dissemination model, I think any popular model, right, it is disseminated, it is readily available both to practitioners and the general public. And I still think something we haven't mentioned that I feel like is somewhat of a classic in the field that if I was recommending to any client fighting for your marriage. I mean, that is really, when I think of you guys, uh, as far as disseminating a lot of your work early on, I forget what year that came out, but talk about that book and how that also helped grow the PrEP approach. Well, we now have three editions of Fighting for Your Marriage. One of the things I'd like to do is actually maybe write a fourth edition with a lot of all the updates we've been talking about. But that really is an expression of the, uh, the PrEP approach at the time for, for professionals who want to learn the program and what we do and for couples who want to use it on their own and individuals. And you know, the idea of fighting for your marriage, I think is really important. We can now say just fighting for your relationship. And you know, the idea that we're really not talking about fighting, of course, but uh, you know, we know that one of the key research findings, it's not the differences between people that matter as much as how people handle those differences. So being able to have healthy communication. And then of course, the fighting part really just goes right into uh, the commitment side of things, making a relationship a priority. And then, of course, a lot in that book has to do with the third pillar of PrEP and third pillar of happy relationships, the handling negative emotions, the uh, protecting and understanding commitment, and uh, making positive connections, fun, friendship, romance, intimacy, sensuality, sexuality, a priority, making sure those times are protected from conflict. And that's a lot of what we express in that book and uh, express in all the different work we do with, uh, with couples and individuals. I think what happened uh, that was pretty exciting with us it was all in that same time period. So the first edition of Fighting for Your Marriage came out in 94. So it's Howard and me and Susan Blumberg. Susan Blumberg now was a grad student then in the 90s with us at DU. So all these things keep hovering around the University of Denver. And she got interested in doing a project on PrEP as her dissertation. And that really propelled all of us into like a major update at that time. And then further major updates, not only to the book. So we started working on a book at that time. But you mentioned manualized programs you know, really improving, systematizing the manuals. And the two things that were happening through the 90s for us that have really just continued now into this millennium is that early 90s, the military started being very interested in the things we were doing, particularly the chaplain corps and the different branches of services. And that interest grew into a lot of training and development of chaplains and social workers and other caregivers in the military and using these strategies to help the couples and individuals that they were working with. So, you know, we had these systems, we had the manualized approaches, uh, and that's really when we started the business, the company of PrEP. And all of that represents what was coming together in our work. So we have these different streams coming together conceptually. We have these different talented people coming together in terms of uh, working with us. And then we have these opportunities happening out in the world in terms of avenues and places where there's an interest in dissemination and there's an interest in educational models. And all that came together to what we do now is we, you know, we have a whole team just outside the university and the, and the business side at PrEP, where it's a built around improving the way we communicate these very basic, powerful ideas and improving the different pathways and the number of pathways we have of getting those ideas into the hands of people that can use them in their own relationship to uh, improve their chances of reaching their goals. I'm glad you brought that up because I was a licensed marriage and family therapist for about seven or eight years before I took the prep training. And it was great because the way it was packaged, even if I knew 
most of the psychoeducation before and had done those skills as a couples therapist, the synergy, the packaging really brought it all together. And I can tell you guys have spent a lot of time on that. So another question I always ask, like, okay, people can read a book or I wonder if you guys know, since you're good historians on your partnership, how many publications you all have authored together? I bet you it's huh. over, is it over a hundred? Oh yeah. De- definitely well over a hundred. <laughs> it's amazing. So you talk about a 40 year partnership and friendship. So I always ask people, tell us something here about you guys that cannot be captured about this relationship between Howard and Scott that cannot be captured in an article or a book or a traditional interview about your research. Now tell us something that well, you'd like the listeners to know that honors this professional marriage that you all have. Well, let me just start with, I don't know if Scott, you remember this, but when we start, Scott mentioned the interest in the military and I came back from a conference in Washington and I told Scott that I met with a prevention specialist in the Navy, a guy named Bill Coffin, who's been amazing in this field. And I said, Bill wants to bring some uh, Navy people out to be trained in the prep approach. And Scott said, yeah. Uh, and I said, yeah, and he wants to develop a contract. And Scott said, you mean they'll pay us for this? Because <laughs> we had done nothing <laughs> thing out of Novel uh, thought. the lab and the research at that point. We weren't even thinking about the, a business model very strongly at that point. That, so that started kind of the company. We needed a, we needed a structure to uh, do all these trainings. That, opportunities that were coming up uh, in the military in uh, parts of the country other countries and I uh, this conversation I remember and we reiterated this I remember Scott and I saying you know what this is a good opportunity but let's not do this let's not do all these workshops and trainings and everything that's going to be coming up unless it's going to be fun for us and that we're going to learn something and I think that's been kind of a solid foundation in terms of that we need to enjoy what we're doing you need to have a passion about it and enjoy it, laugh a lot. And uh, if you know Scott and I individually, you, you would not think we would have a healthy relationship and marriage per se, <laughs> besides our passion for what we do. Uh, I'm uh, Jewish uh, from New York City on the uh, liberal side of things, though I'm a strong supporter of, of the military and uh, keeping our relation our nation safe. But as uh, Scott mentioned before, he's a conservative Christian. So uh, we, we are very, very different, but we handle our differences well. We have great conversations about lots of different things besides relationships. We're all talking about politics. And like I said, just Scott's like, uh, in the Jewish tradition, we have a word that describes a good human being. It's a mensch. And Scott is a mensch. He's a very, very, very good human being. And I'm, I'm just so lucky to have Scott in my life. Thank you, Howard, and and I I would say exactly the same about you. And I, that's where I was going to go on uh, the question that you asked. So Howard mentioned all these differences. So you know he's more liberal. I'm more conservative. I'm just center right. I'm not way over, but I'm definitely more conservative and have more of that background. But we're also really different personalities. I mean, we're. <laughs> I remember one time <laughs> we are. <laughs> uh, we were at a conference and uh, somebody stole. This is way back when they were like cool and new. Somebody stole how he's laser pointer <laughs> and <laughs> and so this is in new york city and we, and i'm from ohio okay I'm a, I'm a kid from ohio i'm introverted i'm i have an extroverted career but i'm a very introverted person so howard and i are walking around he wants a laser pointer i mean because like this is like the hot cool new thing to have so we're walking around times square and at the time you know all these little electronic shops with the big flashy neon <laughs> signs in the windows with the, with the the prices of items and stuff and and i couldn't even believe that they would have an, a laser pointer, but we walk into one of these shops and <laughs> they have a laser pointer, which blew me away. And it has a price tag on it. Now, you know, they're cheap now, right? But this, back at the time, it was $300 price tag on this laser pointer. So here's this kid from Ohio with a, a guy that grew up in uh, New York City and that part of the country. And he starts asking the guy behind the counter, well, how much you want for that? And I'm like, what do you mean how much he wants for that? The price is right there. It's, it's 
on it. It says three hundred dollars. What do you mean? And so he's like negotiating with him. He's he's like into this whole thing that was like just not part of my culture, and it was actually a little traumatic and stressful. I probably need a little therapy about it. But but that's like the whole history of our relationship. We are not the same people. We're very different. And this goes for like with Galena and Susan Blumberg and and all of our other colleagues over the years. Everybody is so different, but we have strong ways of figuring out how do you make that work? How do you work together? How do you take advantage of the strengths? Because we're doing this thing over here that we really all believe in and we enjoy it. And how do we use the best of what we each brings to it? And then how do we keep the most people in the room in terms of what we're doing? And it's just been a wonderful relationship. You know, I study these common factors in listening to these model developers over doing this podcast for the last three years. The common factor is their passion. And as Howard said, enjoying what they do and you all enjoy each other and also challenge each other. It would be boring if you agreed on everything. So clearly after this hour listening to you all, you all are different guys and different energies that complement each other nicely. And the last question is always the legacy question. It's like in 40 plus years, you will have done a lot. And we talk now in these COVID times as far as this online delivery, delivery and making the most of the technology to deliver this important relationship education. What do you want to be remembered for? And what do you still have left that you want to do in the next part of your career, if anything? Scott, why don't you take that first? It's such I'm a big. In what you have to say? <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, it's such a big question, and I don't have a simple answer. Although I, I have the two brief answers uh, that I would say. One is I I think we will be known for. We certainly are at this time. I don't know about 40 years from now, but we really have figured out some things about dissemination and. Like you said, and like you've implied all along here, Eli, if you know if you can't get good ideas out to people that could benefit from them, then you know the ideas can be great, but you're not really getting a lot done. So it's about dissemination, some of which is serendipitous how things have turned out for us. But we think a lot about reach and different mechanisms and different modalities. So I think like if we're known for that, if prep's known, for, and then. Personally, in terms of just conceptually as a scholar, I wouldn't mind being known for some things related to commitment and in particular some of the things that uh, the three of us have done around thinking about the timing and intention and the way things to develop so that people have a, a good appreciation that at times what happens or can happen in relationships is people are giving up options before they've made a choice. And I want people to be able to understand the dynamic between constraint and dedication so that they have a better chance of making the right kind of decision at the right moment while they still have their options open to them. Great, great. So I think for me, just number one, the, uh, the work uh, earlier on that uh, I did with colleagues on just looking at what factors predict divorce and marital distress and relationship success, looking at interaction between people and observational research. So really kind of making a contribution in terms of understanding the importance of communication and conflict management, which I really think is at the heart of the field. And I think those early contributions by myself and colleagues are really, really important. You know, I think number two is related to the, uh, the general prep approach, but the, the idea that we could teach couples uh, in a variety of formats, skills and principles that are associated with a happy relationship and, and knowing what those skills and principles are. I would like to see every single couple, if I could be remembered as the person that helped uh, incorporate into government policies, uh, organizations, uh, getting people at least some relationship education at any point in the relationship and before they have a relationship, the importance of uh, learning some basic communication skills like time out, like speaker listener, understanding the importance of commitment and protecting positive connections, that these basic core principles, I'd like to see every single person, every single couple in the world really have the opportunity to learn this in a variety of ways. And so excited about the possibilities now of using uh, online uh, interventions like our program that's called ePrep to uh, just reach out to any number of people. And I think from a social justice perspective, you know, over time, people 
uh, couples therapy has really been a, a very privileged opportunity for people, and I think remain so. But I think from an education perspective, and I like to be remembered as one of the people who really communicated, we need to get these skills into the hands of people from all backgrounds, all ethnicities, all sexual orientations, all perspectives. And I think uh, we're making some progress. And I'm very excited about the work we're doing around this country and other countries, reaching out to diverse audiences, both in terms of service providers and uh, people who are benefiting from the, uh, the services. And I hope Scott and I and our relationship are remembered as a model for the importance of knowing that science, basic science and service delivery is a team sport. So well said, and I do think of you guys as a team, and I'm looking right now at prepinc.com, which is where you're going to go. It's beautifully laid out for all the different delivery options and formats and different populations and ways that you can learn more about this approach as you're a practitioner and get trained. It's all right there, easily laid out. And there's this great picture of Scott and Howie that you should probably be seeing as you listen to this podcast. Their arms around each other in a great friendship and personal collaboration. I really look at this picture and you, it, it, uh, our talk this hour comes together. So you guys are, are great friends and great collaborators. And I can't thank you enough for being with us on the AMFT podcast. And Eli, I am so grateful for the field of you doing this. It's an amazing service, great question. So thanks for your service. Uh, it's been great talking to you and obviously talking to Scott. Yeah, thank you very much, Eli. And thanks for having us on. Eli, back with you, bringing to a close another successful installment of the AAMFT podcast. Usually, when we do a Pioneer Series interview, it's with one person. Today, the pioneers of relationship education, Howie and Scott. Thank you, guys. That was really great. I learned a lot, and you can listen to that and can tell how much you all admire each other personally and professionally. Let's review some of the things they were talking about very quickly. If you go to prepinc.com, that is your one-stop shop for all things prep. You see a picture of Howie and Scott on there. And whether you're interested in basic prep for couples, which is now in its eighth iteration, that's prep 8.0. You can also get prep winning the workplace challenge. That's for improving workplace relationships, taking these same skills and applying them to work setting. Got your back to address military and servicemen and their relationships with their families. There's Within My Reach, that is the low income work with individuals that was mentioned. Walking the Line addresses the issues that intimates face as they negotiate re- the relationship challenges that come from living in confinement. The material focuses duly on being proactive about improving relationships through whatever means possible prior to release, as well as managing expectations and employing effective relationship strategies after release from the incarceration system. And then we have a faith-based material, which is very new. It's called A Lasting Promise. It's Christian prep for couples, and it's designed to teach proven strategies from traditional prep within a solid Christian framework, starting with a foundation of biblical teachings on marriage. So whatever your population Prep has you covered. Prep Inc. Check it out. Check out their self-paced trainings as well. And the on-demand online version that was mentioned in the interview as well. Again, it's got you covered. Also, I'll point you to a journal article from about six years ago, the journal of Couple Relationship Therapy that I wrote with my colleague Becky Antel, Scott, and Galena Rhodes, who was mentioned in the interview, where we talk about the marriage of couple and relationship education to the practice of marriage and family therapy, a primer for integrated training. That's in the Journal of Couple and Relationship Therapy. We love hearing from you. Drop us a line. The AMFT on Twitter is it at the AAMFT. I'm at Dr. Eli Live. You can send me an email, Eli at NorthStarCounselingCenter.com. Find me at EliCaram.com. K-A-R-A-M. You can find all of our back installments of the AAMFT podcast, over 50 episodes available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, 
I'm partial to the Apple Podcast. Anyway, we'd love for you to leave us a star rating and review. Helps us rise to the ranks of Mental Health Podcast. Until next time, my friends, stay safe, stay systemic.